Hey friends, welcome back to another weekly reading vlog. It is Monday, July 13th, and I'm currently in the middle of two readathons. So I have the Horror and 24 readathon, which is all of this month plus three days in August, and then the Pop Culture readathon, which is taking place the entire month of July. So I've got a lot of books that I need to get through this week and this month in general, but especially this week, I feel like I gotta, I gotta get some good reading in because I did have a pretty slow start this month, but I have been reading some great books and I do have a vlog of last week if you'd like to see what I read to kind of kick off this month. But currently I'm listening to Special Topics and Calamity Physics by Marisha Pessel on my phone. Um, it's free through the Libby library app, at least it is through my library. I'm 11% of the way through that one and it's pretty lengthy. Honestly, I've been reading it for two hours and 17 minutes, according to the timer, and I just have a feeling that this month audiobooks are just not going to be successful for me. I guess I shouldn't group them all together because I did read The House in the Cerulean Sea last week and thought it was good, um, and then I read another book that I did not like whatsoever. This one, I'm not really sure how I feel feel about it. I'm feeling like maybe I should have picked it up um, as a physical book, but it's nothing against the narrator. She's actually pretty good. I just can't stand, um, Blue is the main character in this book, and I can't stand her dad. This is a Dark Academia book, and I am reading it for Read a Dark Academia prompt for the Pop Culture Readathon, but we haven't actually gotten to the Dark Academia college setting yet. It's just kind of setting that up. Um, so Blue, the main character, her father is just such a pretentious dude. He's like very intellectual in a stereotypical old white man who thinks he knows everything um, sort of way, if you know what I mean. And I, and I don't think that it's there as him being a good person. Blue challenges her dad a lot, at least she has so far. Um, and I don't think you're really supposed to like him, so I don't mind that, but he's, it's a slog to read because he is like homeschooling her throughout her entire life and they move from town to town and he's pretty much the only person that she interacts with. So that's been not so fun to read about. I'm excited for Blue to get out of town and go to college because her dad is just not it. Um, like it's just, it's just the little things. It's just a bunch of little things all combined into one. The latest thing was that Blue, who's in high school, uses cool as a word to describe someone, like so-and-so is really cool, and he goes off on this big tangent about how he didn't raise her for 18 years or whatever for her to just use words like cool, and she needs to use better language, and that's just so elitist, and I hate people who think like that in real life. So that's been annoying. My physical book currently is Girl Serpent Thorn. I am really enjoying that. So yeah, I've just been playing Animal Crossing and listening to Special Topics and Calamity Physics. I'll probably take like a quick break and um, probably do some writing for Camp Nano Remo. I'm still doing that, not doing very well on it, honestly, but I am still participating. And I'll probably just have some YouTube on in the background, so. And then of course, I also have to hang out with the pup. So yeah, that's really all the update that I wanted to give you. I just wanted to kick off the vlog. Um, I just ended my last week's vlog, so if this outfit looks familiar, this location looks familiar, I did just end that vlog and I'm starting this one. Um, and I also really need to think of a sit down video for this week, which I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but we'll see what ends up happening. But um, I will talk to you guys tomorrow with another reading update. Happy Wednesday. It's been a while since I've updated you on this reading vlog, but that's because I'm reading this mammoth this week. Listen, I was having a really hard time picking out an audiobook for work, um, so I decided to go with a reread for the audiobook. I absolutely love this audiobook. It is only one person 
but he does such a phenomenal job. At times it really does not feel like one person doing it. It feels almost like a full cast narration. So I picked that up for work and I'm also double duty reading this physically at home because we know it. He's a chunky boy. Um, I am on page 209, so like 10% of the way through the book maybe, not even. And honestly, with like the popularity of the book and also like the two movies that came out, I feel like I don't have to explain too much about this one, which is why I haven't really felt the need to give an update on it. Um, nothing's happened. 200 pages, we're still introducing all of the kids in the Losers Club. I really love this book. I know that there are problematic elements to it. And you know, for that reason alone, I'm probably gonna have to say I do probably like the movies better than the book now that the remakes have come out. I just, I think they're wonderfully done. I love the concept. I love the Losers Club as a group of friends. I want to be a part of it. Let me be a part of it. I also like how they changed the setting. Um, in the book, it it is in the 50s and then in the 80s, but then in the movies they changed it to 80s and present time, which I just think was a really smart decision to make. So yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. It is my favorite Stephen King book and I've never reread it and I've tried to do it, I've tried to do it the past two years, but I always have tried to do it in the fall, which I think was my downfall because this is definitely a summer book. It takes place in the summer, it has summer vibes to it, so I'm really enjoying that one. But I also remembered um, I was only like reading Girl Serpent Thorn the last update. I have finished it since this update and I really enjoyed it. Um, going into it, I was really worried that it was going to be very romance heavy. But you guys, this really takes a left turn fairly quickly. You think it's going to be potentially a very insta-lovey sort of situation and a guy rescuing a damsel in distress push past that. It takes a sharp left turn and then keeps taking sharp left turns. It's And so this was really great. It's kind of a love triangle. And I hesitate to say love triangle, but it is kind of like a love triangle between three very morally gray characters. Um, there's a sapphic romance in here. The main character is bisexual. I really loved how there were two women in this sort of love triangle situation. It's not really a love triangle, but to get any further into it, I feel like it would be very spoilery. So I did really like this. I really enjoyed the world. The only thing that I'd have to say is this was so short, almost too short. There was a distinct change in tone and a distinct change in what was happening, the main goal of the story, like halfway through. I feel like this would have been a wonderful duology. This really worked for me. Um, I don't think it's going to become like an all-time favorite fantasy book. I do think it has a chance to be among my favorite, at least my favorite fantasy books of the year. I think that's in part a large testament to the world building I thought was wonderful. It's such a rich world and I really want more in this world and I would be fine with this not being a standalone. I think it is at this point, but I wish it weren't. Um, and I also really love the main character, Soraya. She was the morally ambiguous bisexual main character that I needed. So enjoyed it. Um, am enjoying it, but again, 200 pages in, nothing's really happened. So there, there's nothing to update. And honestly, I think it is probably going to take up most of my reading this week because it is a mammoth. But I do also want to get to Mexican Gothic. I have been hearing wonderful things about it. And every time it's just been like on my stack, I've really been wanting to pick it up sooner rather than later. So I'm hoping to pick that up. I might take a break from this and pick that up tonight. I did try and pick up Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay. And I'm on like page seven and it was just Paul. Do you have a time machine? Do you, did you know what was going to happen in 2020? Um, it's just, I, there is like on page four, so this isn't spoiler, but it is like a Facebook thread of people talking about this virus and arguing about this virus and arguing about how to best go about it and what the virus actually is and conspiracy theories surrounding it. And if you go on Facebook right now, that's what's happening. <laughs> So I think I'm going to pick this up next week and I also think next week I'm going to go on a social media cleanse and just not go on social media. That's another thing that I wanted to touch on briefly. I just feel like this year very much has been just 2020 has just really been kicking us and kicking us and um, I feel like 
we've just fallen down and it keeps kicking us. This whole Naya Rivera thing has also just really been hitting me hard and I know on some level it is weird feeling so affected towards someone that you don't know. Honestly, if if you feel that way, just I, 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 I don't want to hear it. Um, I, I, I get where you're coming from. The passing of Naya Rivera has really hit me in a way that I don't even really think that I was expecting. When Glee was first coming out, I was in ninth grade. Yes, ninth grade, either eighth grade or ninth grade. Obviously, now that I'm an older adult and I can see a ton of problematic things about it, but on the other hand, it was a wonderful show for kind of helping people feel like they belong and the character of Santana meant a lot to me and really helped me in my personal journey, but Santana really helped me and I know she really helped a lot of people come to terms with themselves and really just own yourself and it's just, man, it just really sucks that we have lost someone like that. I've really lost my train of thought. I don't know how we got, oh yeah, so I'm just, I'm going to be taking a social media cleanse other than YouTube um, for the next week, maybe for longer, just because I, I feel like there's a need to stay informed. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't, especially Twitter. I, I think Twitter is something that I'm going to be getting rid of. I think it's very hard. It's a very hard thing to do to be informed, especially right now. I feel like it's very important to be informed, but if you have a mental illness like I do, um, it's also very hard to stay well and to get better when you have everything at once coming on you and just 24 seven being able to get on your phone and to just see all of that. And this week was hard. I'm saying that and it's Wednesday. So yeah, <laughs> this week has, has been one. And yeah, sorry about this update that just got really in my feels, but Naya Revere was a light and I just, it's that whole thing so fucking tragic. And it's really been affecting my mental health this week. So. I kind of felt remiss not talking about it. I'm also kind of counting the days down at work until we close again. I, I just have a feeling that's coming up. I live in Indiana. My county has a mandatory face mask mandate and it's not being followed. And um, like California, I think it was like Los Angeles just announced that they have to close back down again. And I'm just kind of waiting for that to happen again because I just, I'm nervous for my teacher friends. I'm nervous for my siblings to go back to school. I just, we're not ready. Let's just, 2020 is just a wash. Like let's actually try and sit down and do something instead of doing half-assed efforts and then trying to reopen and then having to do half-assed efforts again. It's just, it's it's been so frustrating for someone who starting March 17th, social isolated and then only stopped social isolating when my job opened back up and I had to to make a living and seeing all those people not give a shit is just fantastic so yeah there's just there's a lot right now and thank god for reading am I right um my both of my sister's birthdays are coming up they're a day apart from each other they're not twins or anything like that one is turning 21 and the other's turning 13 um, but their birthdays are a day apart. So I bought both of their birthday presents yesterday and I also bought myself a little something because yesterday was a day. I read this last year. I absolutely loved it. I loved the Teen Titans growing up. That show was my dream. Raven was the blueprint for so much, for so much. She was probably one of my first crushes. You know, the good old days of childhood where all of your crushes are cartoon characters. Um, we love that. So I was really excited when the Teen Titans um, were kind of getting like their origin stories rebooted. Beast Boy is coming out in September, I believe, and I'm really excited about that as well. So I've already read this, but I have known for like a year that I've wanted it in my collection and I saw it at Target and just decided to treat myself because this is like a small little spark of happiness for a very trying year. <laughs> so thank goodness for fantasy reading. That has been such an escape from this hellscape that is 2020. But this update has been so much longer than I was anticipating it to be. So I will talk to you guys probably tomorrow with another reading update.
happy Friday. Welcome to another reading update where I didn't get as much reading done as I would have liked, but today turned out very differently than I thought it was going to at the start of today. I was originally supposed to work, um, and my current position, I work mostly in the back room with shipment. I woke up this morning and was not feeling going into work. Like, I was just so tired. It was one of those days where you just don't even have the motivation. Like, you'll wake up but still kind of be asleep no matter what you do. Luckily, it was really good timing for me to really not be motivated to go into work because the shipment didn't actually come in this morning. So I was originally supposed to work today and have tomorrow off, but instead I'm working tomorrow. So I had today all the way off, which also really worked out in my favor because my dad actually came and helped me figure out what was wrong with my car. I think I mentioned like last week that we thought it was just the battery and we fixed the battery, but something having to do with like suspension is also wrong with it. So it's gonna be a tougher fix than we thought. So that's unfortunate. And my dad's really good with cars, but he's obviously not that good with cars because that requires ordering new parts in and it's more than like a one man job. So um, that was really good timing because I got to see him today, which was very nice. So I didn't actually get much reading done today, but yesterday I got a ton of reading done and um, I'm still chugging through it. I, yeah, I'm still very much, none of the losers have reunited yet. They're all on their way to Derry to meet each other as adults for the first time. So that's really exciting. We're getting to the part where Ben is at the library and he is running away from some bullies and he stumbles upon some of the other kids. And that's the first time that they actually interact with Ben. So that's really nice. I really love Ben. I think he's a sweetheart. So I'm excited to get further into that I did pick up Mexican Gothic and I am on page 139 so I'm pretty much at the halfway point through this book and I understand why a lot of people aren't really taking to this one but I also have to say it's definitely in the name this is a modern gothic tale well not really modern it does take place in the 1950s but it is very gothic and style. It's very slow. It's very stylized. There is a lot of description in here, which I have absolutely been loving. Honestly, I feel like a lot of people also might think this is a little bit slow because there's really only been one really creepy scene in here so far. But on the other hand, I'm reading it. So really anything is going to kind of read like a fast paced book in comparison. So I am really enjoying this so far. It is very gothic. The descriptions of the house are really wonderful and descriptions of even like the town and different settings, temperature, it's all so wonderful. And like I mentioned before, there's only been one really creepy scene, but the level of description, I think if I were listening to it on audiobook, it would have been very, very unsettling. But just a little tiniest of tiny spoiler, um, the creepiest part was actually like a dream sequence that may or may not be a dream and the way that it was written was so dreamlike the way the description was was wonderful so i am looking forward to seeing what comes next in the rest of the book just in terms of i think this is going to be very quiet very understated sort of book so i'm actually hoping to finish that tonight i would love to pick up maybe survivor song that's one that i've also really been craving getting to this month but we'll see. I have also in the past couple of days realized that Sailor Moon is on Hulu. I don't know if this is a new development or if I just have been living under a rock because that show was my jam when I was a kid. I really enjoyed it. Um, it was one of those shows where one of my childhood really good friends. They were obsessed with like anime and manga so we would watch Sailor Moon whenever we'd go over to their house. So I have been watching, re-watching a lot of Sailor Moon. And actually for a quick non-book related question, leave a comment down below. Do you prefer subs or dubs? I have not decided. I know that's something that a lot of people feel very passionately about. For Sailor Moon, I've only ever watched it in the dubbed version. So I think my first rewatch of that is going to be with the dubs and then I might go back and watch it with the subtitles because it is very charming and very wonderful. I'm so excited it's on Hulu. Again, I don't like, is this a recent development? I feel like 
I should have known that it was on Hulu before now, but I'm not complaining. I've been in like the biggest rabbit hole of that, so yeah, that's kind of been putting my reading on a little bit of a downward slope this week. So depending on the amount of footage in this vlog, I'm going to try and vlog some more. Saturday for sure is going to be in this vlog and then maybe Sunday as well. We will have to see. But yeah, that's really all I got for you guys. Um, I'm probably going to hopefully finish Mexican Gothic tonight. If I start watching Sailor Moon, it's going to be over for me because that is definitely like a background show, but it definitely clashes with this. I feel like definitely this, the vibes of Mexican Gothic and Sailor Moon just don't really go that well together. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some reading done and I will check back in with you guys tomorrow. Hey friends, happy Saturday. So I actually just finished Mexican Gothic and I really enjoyed this one. I'm really glad I picked it up. I know that a lot of people have been super disappointed by it and a lot of people have super loved it and I totally understand both points of view. I really enjoyed it, but I will say, um, true to its name, if you don't like gothic horror, don't pick this up. Um, I think it's very true to that style of horror and that style of writing. This also does really deal with dreams and magical realism as well, and a little bit of the paranormal supernatural. So if you don't like any of that combined with that gothic horror, I would just kind of skip this one because I know that's not for for everyone, but I really enjoyed it. I think that this also makes a really good point. There was a lot of imagery and symbolism in here. This kind of goes along with something that I've been seeing on Twitter recently and something that I've had some discussions with, with my school-aged siblings um, and just people in general about how I really think that for school reading, it shouldn't be such a heavy emphasis on the same couple of classics written primarily by white men. The emphasis on just like 20 or so, you know, I'd say there's like a list of 20 or so books at least least in American schooling that um, pretty much everyone has to read during their school experience and while some of those differ I feel like it's always like the same couple of books and I think it makes a lot of kids really burn out on reading. I don't think that there is a lot in any of those books that can't be shown in more recent books. I think that any of the lessons or any of the symbology, whatever you're trying to teach your students with older classics, um, you can find in modern literature. I mean, sure, don't get rid of them completely, but I think it definitely needs to be more of a mix. Um, like the earliest book that I had on my high school curriculum for sure was probably Catcher in the Rye. I think that was the most recent book that was on my, our required reading list, which is a little problematic, you know? I have read so many good books that have beautiful imagery and have symbolism and that you can discuss and have kids be more engaged with reading. And I know it's not like teacher's fault. I know like the teachers themselves have certain um, curriculum standards and everything to teach. And again, I don't think we should get rid of all classics, but I think this was a really wonderful example of a book that I feel like it could be taught in class. This does have some very triggering things. The biggest trigger for this one, I would say, is um, not rape, but a lot of unwanted advances by men, um, unwanted sexual advances. It never gets to rape, but it gets pretty close a couple of times. So I'm not saying this book in specific, but I think just the way this book was written, I think that this could be taught in a classroom setting. And you know, honestly, a lot of classics had a lot of horrendous things in them that weren't actually challenged and weren't portrayed to be bad things. So you could have this in there. I really enjoyed it. The reason why I was talking so much about symbolism is I would really like to read this from the beginning, knowing what I know at the end and going into it, knowing all of that and rereading it. So I might try and reread this I don't know. This year might be a little premature. Um, I could see this honestly being on like a short list of Goodreads Best Horror of 2020. So I might reread this if it pops up on any of those lists um, during the Halloween season. I think it's definitely a very strong gothic horror that I have read and um, I really loved it. And um, yeah, the night is still young. I do want to work out. I'm waiting for my pre-workout to kick in right now. But I think tonight I am planning on maybe picking up some Survivor song. I'd like to read that tonight and finish it up on Sunday. Um, and then I'm still chugging through it. I'm probably on like page 300 something. I've been listening to the audiobook, so I don't have a page count for you, but 
still chugging along um that one so that's been really fun i've been in such a horror mood this book really made me want to move into a house in the middle of nowhere i understand that's not the point of horror but every time that i see a haunted house a haunted gothic house i want to move into it i don't even care if there's ghosts they can be my friends so that's really all i've got for this reading update mexican gothic highly recommend um, this probably is one of the best horror books that I've read this year so far, quite honestly, just because this book really felt like a classic in terms of writing, but in an accessible way, and it just, it, it was very atmospheric, and I absolutely loved it, so, um, I will check back in with you guys tomorrow with another reading update and to close out the vlog. <laughs> Happy Sunday. This may or may not be my last clip of the vlog. So I thought I would do just like a quick little wrap up of the books that I read this month. I'm hoping to finish one more by the end of the day, but just in case I don't, this is what I've read this week. First off, I've been making my way through it very slowly. It is a reread for me. I'm really enjoying taking my time, enjoying what happens. I know what's going to happen and just really enjoying the characterization and the audiobook of this one. I'm taking it very slowly and I'm not too concerned. I'm nowhere near finishing it, but I do have, I believe, almost two full weeks two full weeks until I have to finish it by the end of the month. So I know it sounds very strange to say that this has been my comfort read of the month because, you know, horror and all of that, but this has definitely been my comfort read that I've kind of been like reading at night or reading when I'm just a little bit more stressed. So I've been making my way through that. And then the first book that I finished this week was Girl Serpent Thorn. I really enjoyed this one. This is a YA fantasy that does have a little bit of a romance centric plot, which is not usually something that I am super into. And it was a little bit short, but I absolutely love the characters. I love the world. And it was very impressive that I was so attached to the main characters by the end of this book because it's a short guy. For fantasy, it is very short and I do believe it is a standalone, but I did really enjoy this one. I enjoyed getting to see a bisexual main character in a fantasy because I don't like reading contemporary romance books, but I do like seeing that rep in books, so that was really fun to see and I loved all of the morally gray main characters in that one. I also finished Mexican Gothic this week. I really enjoyed this one. I know a lot of people, this is probably going to be a miss for them. Just go into it knowing that, like the title says, it's a gothic horror. There is a lot of heavy atmosphere. It is very slow. The horrific elements, you don't really get into like the truly horrific things until like the very last couple of chapters of the book, but the slow burn for this was absolutely wonderful. The atmosphere was wonderful. I really enjoyed all of the description and imagery, and this is one that I would be interested in reading again in October. I have a feeling this is going to be on a lot of lists for best horror that was published in 2020. There are a lot of very bizarre trigger warnings for this one but if you look up the trigger warnings and you're like well why is all this in a book that sounds absolutely horrible you know horrible things are done by horrible people they're all questioned they're all challenged they're clearly not being promoted um and it's like a, it's a very wild ride that I don't want to spoil but definitely look up trigger warnings there are a lot of gory horrific things that happen in here um even though like it starts so slowly you don't realize you're like neck deep in all this creepy shit until it all happens at once so I really enjoyed this one I don't think it's going to be a book for everyone or would I recommend it to everyone but I think that people who love gothic horror and people who love really descriptive writing really symbolism filled writing and like a very dream like sort of atmosphere are really going to like this book and then the last book that I've been reading that I want to try and finish today is Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay I don't know whether to say this is the perfect time to read this book or the worst time to read this book because this is about a plague that is a very fast acting sort of rabies virus. This came out this month so obviously it was written way before any of this COVID-19 stuff happened. It's crazy how many things that are discussed that like are very 
prevalent in like actual issues today um like there's this one little section where the main characters there are some doctors and some nurses and they're talking in a group chat um, and discussing like how ill-prepared their hospitals are how they don't have the right masks they don't have the right equipment um they're running out of the equipment and higher-ups in the government are just kind of saying oh it's no big deal we're actually prepared even when the doctors and nurses totally aren't so i mean this is like a very wild time to read this book because you're reading it and so many things are actually happening um, in our world, just how different people respond to a pandemic and how like our infrastructure would respond to a pandemic. I will say in this one, they're actually, you know, mandating a quarantine a little more thoroughly than um, we are at the moment. I think that's like the true horror is kind of exploring um, one of the main characters is an OBGYN and her and her team are shunted to the front lines to try and help out with these rabies patients and like they don't study that type of medicine so they're trying to help they are doctors they are medical professionals but not in that sense and they're not being given any information by the government and they're freaking out because like they want the government to listen to the cdc and have the cdc tell them what to do and that's not happening and that's crazy because that's literally what's happening in america right now so it is a wild trip to read this and see how much paul trembling gets right and that's a thing that i have always loved about horror is that a lot of horror does actually talk about um especially like horror movies and horror books if you look at when they're written and look at the monsters or the horrors that they're describing um there's like a lot of symbolism based on like the horrors and fears of the general public at the time and so this is a very very timely book so like silver lining i'm very glad that it's not like this zombie apocalypse sort of thing going on but we are in a pandemic and it's crazy but another thing that i do really like about paul tremblay's book is it's not necessarily so much about the horror itself that's being explored i would have to say that a lot of the times his books like the grand finale or whatever there's like a chapter or two after that um that really delves into like the characters exploring what happened the characters trying to emotionally deal with what's happened and just exploring you know emotions and relationships with people during that i think disappearance at devil's rock was the best kind of example of that where a lot of the most horrifying things is just exploring what trauma does to you um and how missing a loved one that is horrifying but just the mental toll that it takes on you is also horrifying as well um this one is definitely exploring that because the main two characters are two friends from college and they have grown apart after college um but one of the main characters is heavily pregnant she's like eight and a half months pregnant and she gets bitten by an infected and so she does not have a lot of time so she actually goes to her college best friend who is a doctor and they're trying to write out this landscape together they're trying to make their way to a hospital so that hopefully they can save the baby because um it's a very fast acting rabies virus like a zombie virus so um I know this one's going to be very hard hitting um because yeah i'm like almost halfway through and i know it's going to be very hard hitting at the end probably with what's being discussed so that is my update so far i will check back in maybe later on to let you know how i felt about survivor song because i am hoping to finish it by the end of today So I'm not done with this yet. I still am going to finish it tonight, but I just realized um, that there's a cameo in this book. From Disappearance at Devil's Rock, there is a cameo, a character that comes into play. I'm not going to spoil it, and I almost didn't catch it because I read this um, in the beginning of 2018, so it has been a while. Um, but something that a character said in here made me pause and be like, wait, that is actually a ton like Disappearance at Devil's Rock. And then I had to go back and check it here to see this character's backstory, and it is the same character. So so that's really cool. Um, if you haven't read Disappearance at Devil's Rock, you definitely don't need to. Um, it's just like a fun little cameo. Um, a little something, like a little something might be, like you might not understand it, but I mean, yeah. 
So if you have the option, I would read this one first. This is personally, I think, Paul Tremblay's best book that he's written. It's not my favorite just because personally, I don't think I'll be able to reread this in full for a really long time because it really messed me up because it was so wonderfully written. Um, and it, it's heartbreaking. This book is heartbreaking. Read that one and then read this one. It's a delightful cameo. That's insane. Um, I also wanted to read a quick little segment that really explains why this book is very prophet-esque and is coming at an interesting time in America. So, the virus doesn't herald the end of the world or of the United States or even of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In the coming days, conditions will continue to deteriorate. Emergency services and other public safety nets will be stretched to their breaking points, exacerbated by the wily antagonists of fear, panic, misinformation, myopic, sluggish federal bureaucracy further hamstrung by a president unwilling and woefully unequipped to make the rational, science-based decisions necessary, and exacerbated, of course, by plain old individual everyday evil. In the final tally of what will be considered the end of the epidemic, but not to be clear, the end of the virus, it will burrow, digging in like a nasty tick, it will migrate and it will return, all but encouraged and welcomed in a country where science and forethought are allowed to be dirty words, where humanity's greatest invention, the vaccine, is smeared and vilified by narcissistic, purposeful fools, the most dangerous kind, where fear is harvested for fame, profit, and self-esteem. So yeah, I'm almost done with it, but now I almost want to go back and reread certain sections of this, knowing that the character was in Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and I already know this book is gonna wreck me. Listen, Paul Tremblay's books, I don't think that they're the most scary in terms of ghosts or monsters hiding underneath your bed or, you know, really spooky, traditional scary things, but the emotional toll that his books take upon you is a lot. So I have like 70 pages left of this and I will check back in when this book has finished wrecking me. So I finished Survivor Song. That was a journey. I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. Just for the sake of me needing to uh, get my vlog up tomorrow, I'm not gonna really give it a rating. I'm not going to talk too much about it because it really packs an emotional punch at the end. And I just want to sit with this one a little bit. I don't think it's going to be my favorite book of Paul Tremblay's just because I'm not a really big fan of zombie fiction. I know it's like a recurring thing in this book that it's not a zombie fiction because it's not a zombie virus. It's rabies, it's different, but like that's not my favorite subgenre. It's one that I used to really love and one that I would have told you a couple years ago that I would have like would have been one of my favorite genres, but I just I, I've I haven't really enjoyed anything zombie in a long time, which is why I was a little nervous going into this one, but this really surprised me in all the best ways. This was still wonderful. Um, I am surprised to kind of hear that this is getting kind of mixed reviews. Just because I feel like Paul Tremblay has historically very ambiguous endings. Um, you can really play them two different ways. Head Full of Ghosts, definitely the ending could be whatever you wanted it to be. Um, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, that could be whatever you wanted it to be. And then um, Cabin at the End of the World also was very open-ended, um, which I really love in a story. A lot of people don't. This one is very, like, this is top tier apocalypse zombie fiction. So maybe people are just like expecting something like a little more out of the box from him, but I really loved it. The ending really hits you hard. And honestly, I was looking through reviews and no one has mentioned the cameo from Disappearance at Devil's Rock. So I don't know if that's something that like everyone knows and I'm super late to and it's not a big deal. Or if I'm like, the only one that I've seen on my feed so far that has caught that, but I thought that was genius storytelling, um, and I thought that actually successfully concluded a lot of what was in um, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, kind of explaining what happened to some of the characters afterwards. So if you've never read it, I'd probably suggest picking it up before this one. Um, you know, read them back to back if you want that good old one-two punch in the gut. I was initially very nervous going into this week because a lot of people that I saw on my feeds actually were not really enjoying Survivor Song or Mexican Gothic. So I was very nervous because, again, a lot of people said they both started out strong and then ended badly. So 
I was nervous I was going to um, not really enjoy the books that I read this week, but honestly, Mexican Gothic and Survivor Song are two of the best horror books that I've read this year. And I feel like both of them are going to be on the Goodreads Best Horror of 2020 lists. Um, I feel like Tremblay usually is on there just because of his name, but Silvio Moreno Garcia also, I think we're gonna see her name on there as well, which would be really neat. If you don't tend to like zombie fiction, but you are a fan of Paul Tremblay, um, I would say still pick this one up because it's still his writing style that's so beautiful. There's a lot of exploration of different, on well, this one it's like a found family sort of trope and the importance of friendships in difficult times. There are like two pretty big friendships in here. Um, so I really enjoyed those discussions. I, if you have any COVID or apocalypse anxiety um, or pandemic anxiety about what's going on, don't pick this up. It's it's very timely. My hand keeps getting tired, so that's why I keep switching my positions right now. But this is very timely. If I were a tinfoil hat sort of person, I would question why all of this apocalyptic virus type horror is coming out this year because it's a little too timely and you know, a lot of parts really hit home. I actually left a note in the beginning of my book just because I really want to remember that I did read this for the first time during the COVID-19 pandemic because that just adds a little extra layer because I think if this would have come out and um, world events wouldn't have happened, I don't think this would have had as much of a punch as it did because I think it's really easy, especially in like zombie fiction or something like that, to kind of criticize authors' choices and say, oh, our government would never do something like that. Um, our leadership would never do something like that. This is unrealistic. And a lot of the things that happen in here are things that our government is doing right now, so. And like a lot of the ways that the people react in very terrible ways, you know, I feel like that's also a trope in zombie fiction that a lot of times the people um, are worse than the zombies themselves and you always really hope that that's not the case but you know you read some of the people in here and you're you're definitely you're definitely side-eyeing people that you've seen on Facebook that are posting about how COVID is a um, government hoax so I really enjoyed it. Paul Tremblay is top tier horror for me. He's definitely an auto buy author for me um, like Stephen King, Joe Hill, Paul Tremblay, Grady Hendrix are all autobiographers, even like their worst books are books that I still enjoy. Um, and by no means am I saying this is the worst book that Paul Tremblay has written. It's just definitely a weird time for this book to be published because I think a lot of people might be turned off by the premise just because it's it, it did hit a little too close to home, honestly. But I wanted to go ahead and sit down and put my review out here just because I have been seeing some negative ones. And I think this is a really good book and it's, it's gonna stick with me. It's gonna sit with me for a while. It was very short. Most of the fiction involving similar circumstances I feel like goes on for a longer amount of time, but this was all in the span of a day, which made the pacing of this book really, really good. I thought it was paced wonderfully. I really enjoyed the characters. I loved the cameo from Disappearance at Devil's Rock. Um, so... If you're on the fence about picking it up, I know a lot of people were not the biggest fans of this one, but I absolutely loved it. And that is coming from someone who doesn't like zombie horror. I know this isn't technically zombie horror, so, but it has to deal with a virus, um, a rabies virus that acts a whole lot like zombies. I really enjoyed it. Paul Tremblay can do no wrong. I'm looking forward to, I think pretty much he comes out with a book every year. So I'm definitely looking forward to what he comes out with next. But that is going to be the end of this weekly reading vlog. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to give it a like, leave a comment down below and subscribe to my channel for more content. I'll catch y'all in my next video. Bye.